This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. Today's reading by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. The Road to Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 11. Johnny Do It, Does It. It's getting awful rough walking, said Dorothy, as they trudged along. Button Bright gave a deep sigh, and said he was hungry. Indeed, all were hungry and thirsty, too, for they had eaten nothing but the apples since breakfast, so their steps lagged, and they grew silent and weary. At last they slowly passed over the crest of a barren hill, and saw before them a line of green trees with a strip of grass at their feet. An agreeable fragrance was wafted toward them. Our travellers, hot and tired, ran forward on beholding this refreshing sight, and were not long in coming to the trees. Here they found a spring of pure bubbling water, around which the grass was full of wild strawberry plants, their pretty red berries ripe and ready to eat. Some of the trees bore yellow oranges, and some russet pears, so the hungry adventurers suddenly found themselves provided with plenty to eat and to drink. They lost no time in picking the biggest strawberries and ripest oranges, and soon had feasted to their heart's content. Walking beyond the line of trees they saw before them a fearful, dismal desert, everywhere grey sand. At the edge of this awful waste was a large sign, with black letters neatly painted upon it, and the letters made these words. "'All persons are warned not to venture upon this desert.' for the deadly sands will turn any living flesh to dust in an instant. Beyond this barrier is the land of Oz, but no one can reach that beautiful country because of these destroying sands. "'Oh,' said Dorothy, when the shaggy man had read this sign aloud, "'I've seen this desert before, and it's true no one can live who tries to walk upon the sands.' "'Then we mustn't try it,' answered the shaggy man thoughtfully. "'But as we can't go ahead, and there's no use going back, what shall we do next?' "'Don't know,' said Button Bright. "'I'm sure I don't know either,' added Dorothy despondently. "'I wish Father would come for me,' sighed the pretty Rainbow's daughter. "'I would take you all to live upon the Rainbow, where you could dance along its rays from morning till night, without a care or worry of any sort.' "'but I suppose father's too busy just now to search the world for me.' "'Don't want to dance,' said Button Bright, sitting down wearily upon the soft grass. "'It's very good of you, Polly,' said Dorothy. "'But there are other things that would suit me better than dancing on rainbows. "'I'm afraid they'd be kind of soft and squenchy underfoot anyhow, although they're so pretty to look at.' "'This didn't help to solve the problem.' and they all fell silent, and looked at one another questioningly. "'Really, I don't know what to do,' muttered the shaggy man, gazing hard at Toto, and the little dog wagged his tail and said, "'Bow wow!' just as if he could not tell either what to do. Button Bright got a stick and began to dig in the earth, and the others watched him for a while in deep thought. Finally the shaggy man said, "'It's nearly evening now, so we may as well sleep in this pretty place and get rested. Perhaps by morning we can decide what is best to be done.' There was little chance to make beds for the children, but the leaves of the trees grew thickly, and would serve to keep off the night dews. So the shaggy man piled soft grasses in the thickest shade, and when it was dark they lay down and slept peacefully until morning. Long after the others were asleep, however, the shaggy man sat in the starlight by the spring, gazing thoughtfully into its bubbling waters. Suddenly he smiled and nodded to himself as if he had found a good thought, after which he, too, laid himself down under a tree, and was soon lost in slumber. In the bright morning sunshine, as they ate of the strawberries and sweet juicy pears, Dorothy said, "'Polly, can you do any magic?' "'No, dear.' answered Polychrome, shaking her dainty head. "'You ought
ought to know some magic, being the rainbow's daughter, continued Dorothy earnestly. But we who live on the rainbow among the fleecy clouds have no use for magic, replied Polychrome. What I'd like, said Dorothy, is to find some way to cross the desert to the land of Oz and its emerald city. I've crossed it already, you know, more than once. First, a cyclone carried my house over, and some silver shoes brought me back again in half a second. Then Ozma took me over on her magic carpet. And the Gnome King's magic belt took me home that time. You see, it was magic that did it every time except the first, and we can't expect a cyclone to happen along and take us to the Emerald City now. No, indeed, returned Polly with a shudder. I hate cyclones anyway. That's why I wanted to find out if you could do any magic, said the little Kansas girl. I'm sure I can't, and I'm sure Button Bright can't. And the only magic the shaggy man has is the love magnet, which won't help us much. Don't be too sure of that, my dear, spoke the shaggy man, a smile on his donkey face. I may not be able to do magic myself, but I can call to us a powerful friend who loves me because I own the love magnet, and this friend surely will be able to help us. Who is your friend? asked Dorothy. Johnny d o i t What can Johnny do? Anything, answered the shaggy man with confidence. Ask him to come, she exclaimed eagerly. The shaggy man took the love magnet from his pocket and unwrapped the paper that surrounded it. Holding the charm in the palm of his hand, he looked at it steadily and said these words Dear Johnny d o i t come to me. I need you bad as bad can be. Well, here I am, said a cheery little voice. But you shouldn't say you need me bad, cause I'm always, always good. At this they quickly whirled around to find a funny little man sitting on a big copper chest, puffing smoke from a long pipe. His hair was gray, his whiskers were gray, and these whiskers were so long that he had wound the ends of them around his waist and tied them in a hard knot underneath the leather apron that reached from his chin nearly to his feet. And which was soiled and scratched as if it had been used a long time. His nose was broad and stuck up a little, but his eyes were twinkling and merry. The little man's hands and arms were hard and tough as the leather in his apron, and Dorothy thought Johnny d o i t looked as if he had done a lot of hard work in his lifetime. Good morning, Johnny, said the shaggy man. Thank you for coming to me so quickly. I never waste time. Said the newcomer promptly. But what's happened to you? Where did you get that donkey head? Really, I wouldn't have known you at all, Shaggy Man, if I hadn't looked at your feet. The Shaggy Man introduced Johnny d o i t to Dorothy and Toto and Button Bright and the Rainbow's daughter, and told him the story of their adventures, adding that they were anxious now to reach the Emerald City in the land of Oz, where Dorothy had friends who would take care of them and send them safe home again. But, said he, we find that we can't cross this desert, which turns all living flesh that it touches into dust, so I have asked you to come and help us. Johnny d o i t puffed his pipe and looked carefully at the dreadful desert in front of them, stretching so far away they could not see its end. You must ride, he said briskly. What in? asked the shaggy man. In a sand boat which has runners like a sled and sails like a ship. The wind will blow you swiftly across the desert, and the sand cannot touch your flesh to turn it into dust. Good! cried Dorothy, clapping her hands delightedly. That was the way the magic carpet took us across. We didn't have to touch the horrid sand at all. But where is the sand boat? asked the shaggy man, looking all round him. I'll make you one. Said Johnny d o i t As he spoke, he knocked the ashes from his pipe and put it in his pocket. Then he unlocked the copper chest and lifted the lid, and Dorothy saw it was full of shining tools of all sorts and shapes. Johnny d o i t moved quickly now, so quickly that they were astonished at the work he was able to accomplish. He had in his chest a tool for everything he wanted to do, 
and these must have been magic tools because they did their work so fast and so well. The man hummed a little song as he worked, and Dorothy tried to listen to it. She thought the words were something like these. The only way to do a thing is do it when you can, and do it cheerfully and sing, and work and think and plan. The only real unhappy one is he who dares to shirk. The only really happy one is he who cares to work. Whatever Johnny Dewitt was singing, he was certainly doing things, and they all stood by and watched him in amazement. He seized an axe, and in a couple of chops felled a tree. Next he took a saw, and in a few minutes sawed the tree trunk into broad long boards. He then nailed the boards together into the shape of a boat, about twelve feet long and four feet wide. He cut from another tree a long slender pole which, when trimmed of its branches and fastened upright in the center of the boat, served as a mast. From the chest he drew a coil of rope and a big bundle of canvas, and with these, still humming his song, he rigged up a sail, arranging it so it could be raised or lowered upon the mast. Dorothy fairly gasped with wonder to see the thing grow so speedily before her eyes. And both Button Bright and Polly looked on with the same absorbed interest. It ought to be painted, said Johnny Dewitt, tossing his tools back into the chest, for that would make it look prettier. But though I can paint it for you in three seconds, it would take an hour to dry, and that's a waste of time. We don't care how it looks, said the shaggy man, if only it will take us across the desert. It will do that. Declared Johnny Dewitt. All you need worry about is tipping over. Did you ever sail a ship? I've seen one sailed, said the shaggy man. Good. Sail this boat the way you've seen a ship sailed, and you'll be across the sands before you know it. With this, he slammed down the lid of the chest, and the noise made them all wink. While they were winking, the workmen disappeared, tools and all. End of chapter 11.